Amber, what's the hottest gossip you can ever think of? The like, film world gossip yeah. is that Chloe Savigny has not made a film in at least six years. And I'm in love with her, and I'm going to need her to come back to independent film world. What is the attraction of Chloe Savigny? She looks like a normal girl. She has wrinkles. She has titties that are natural. She's a natural, normal girl. And she's, like, from the skate scene. Like, she's from the Baker zoo york early skate scene in new york like and that's what is really important about her she's just a big tomboy ended up hollywood famous and like is in the shadows because she doesn't have a brazilian butt lift do you think chloe savigny would be uh more famous if she had a brazilian butt lift the fact that she doesn't even want to be famous is what makes her herself if she had a bbl she would absolutely be more famous what would you want chloe to to be in if she were to decide to return to movies i would like chloe savigny to be in a contemporary remake of the magnificent ambersons by orson welles that was a shockingly nerdy answer i was not i like just got flashbanged by that answer <laughs> That's one of my favorite films. <laughs> That's like an immaculate response. Like, I've never had a cooler response on this show really? of someone who's like, what would I like? Oh, I would like the Magnificent Ambersons. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly Maybe what Maybe with happened. like space travel instead of like the dawning of automotive. Chloe would be perfect. Yeah. Chloe, look me Put in the eye. Put her in a eye. tight suit. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe, if you're watching, you're needed. We need you. You ever watch The Avengers with John Steed and Emma Peel? Mrs. Peel, you're needed. Anyway, welcome to <laughs> Support Local Film. This is your local film podcast with, you know, unfortunately, subpar hosts are pretty unhinged, but we have something really exciting for you. Amber, what's on the docket? What's on the docket today is interviewing with... <laughs> What's up, guys? <laughs> Michael, explain who you are. Uh, so my name is Michael Neve. I am a local editor uh, and visual effects artist that works in the Denver and Boulder area. And my latest project of note is a 40-minute documentary, um, adventure documentary for uh, Eddie Bauer uh, entitled Dalagiri. So Dalagiri is really exciting. We're going to talk about that. But, you mm -hmm. know, we don't get to interview a lot of editors on the show most of the time because they're uh, you know a little timid we try to reach out to them mm -hmm. what do you think is the best and most important things to know about an editor for the unenlightened the way that i see editing is that like we're basically the last line of defense between the director and the audience um so <laughs> you know because like when i when i edit i'm i'm sitting down and i'm imagining like as an audience member okay like how emotionally do I want this scene to affect me or how do I want this to feel? Um, and so it's basically just a lot of um, back and forth and working with the director to execute their vision um, from that. And then like in the case of Dollar you know, had a hundred hours of footage easily um, that we had to whittle down into, you know, we were looking at anywhere from 35 minutes to an hour um, and um, basically just picking what's best uh, and and cutting those scenes together so that they feel natural and they feel real. When I think of something like this, I think it's going to go on Discovery, or I think it's going to go on like you know one of your travel, you know, TV channels. Maybe uh, it's going to be a documentary you might see on Hulu. I don't think a hundred hours. So what is the challenge about that a hundred hours? Is it all quality, you know, high content kind of like informational material? You have to decide what's the best. In the case of this film, like the first thing that I did when I was told that I was going to be editing it was like I sat down and watched. Um, at that point, it was like it was only about 60 hours of footage. And then it ballooned up to 40 because we had additional um, archive footage and thing like that. Uh, things like that came in. Um, but yeah, like, of course, um, like the big thing for me was that like I uh, helped out quite a bit on the writing process side of things, because basically what you do is you take all of that footage and then you run it through transcription and then you write a script based on that transcription and then edit to that script. Within that, like a lot of a lot of editing a documentary was about like just simply how to structure a story and then how to edit the scene so that it felt cinematic while telling the story that you wanted to present. The dream is to write an amazing book. As a mountaineer, as a climber, climbing any route is like you live something that represents you in the place you love. And this is not coming from an ego point of view. This is coming from a curiosity 
point of view. I want to see what I am really capable of. Now, when we went to film school together, um, full disclosure, we were roommates. Yeah, we were. Yeah. You know, um, we lived together. It was a fun time in Denver. It was an awkward time in Denver. It was a scary time in Denver, but it was a yeah, good time in Denver. Yeah, because it was right, uh, it was right uh, at the start of the pandemic. It was, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we're, we're better now. Yeah. But back then, you did narrative film. So what was it like getting into documentary film, and why, why now are you, like, really jumping in? Well, um, I didn't choose documentary. Documentary chose me. Um, it was it, it was more of like, because, you know, throughout 2020, like a lot of people, I wasn't employed. Like I just, um, yeah, like, you know, it's like a very regular thing. Like um, a lot of people, like including myself, had come out of college and they're trying to enter the workforce while this big pandemic is going on and everyone's getting laid off. And um, so, you know, I did what everyone else did, which is like if they could move back in uh, with their parents, hunker down and basically just send out job applications every single day. Um, and eventually I got my in at Triage Creative by uh, contacting another one of our, you know, Colorado Film School alumni, Davis Birch. Love him. Um, yeah, he's a great guy. You should get him on here one time if he's down for it because he's very funny. Davis, come um, on the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he also worked on, on Dalagiri providing a lot of editorial support, so – Shout out to him. He, he did a good job. But we love you. Um, he was basically my in to this company because he had been working um, for the director of this film, Tommy, for about two years. Um, and basically, like, I, I reached out to him because I heard they were hiring. And I was like, hey, man, can you put a good word in for me? And he was like, sure. Um, and so that happened. And then basically the way that I got hired was that I had, like, a Zoom interview with Tommy. And we talked for about 30 minutes. And then by the end of that interview, it was basically like, oh, yeah, like you're hired. And then he was off to, to shoot the Dalagiri film the next day. And my original role on the film was just to do uh, the visual effects and like the mountain graphics and things like that. But then eventually that that turned into that led to me um, editing the full film. And yeah. you got hotter after after college. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I learned how to dress myself. You know, the, the the skill that most men don't learn how to do until they realize, like, oh, wait, like, I actually want to get laid. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> the floral prints, prints really do work for you. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I mean, like, basically, it was just, yeah, I don't want to get too far off topic, but I did, uh, I, va I very much came out of my shell after college, um, largely because of one story that I do like to, I don't think I've told this publicly, but... Basically, when we were living together and we went to the bar down the street during COVID, like every single day, I don't know if you remember this, but you were really drunk. And then you said you said something along the lines of like, Michael, like, you know, I just wish the world knew more about you. And the reason why you said that was because, like, I was very reclusive at that time and didn't really do much outside of like editing and staying in my room. Um, and, you know, ever since that, you know, that's been a guiding a guiding moment in my life. Um, and, and I decided to, you know, like stop being a loser. <laughs> and in return, you left all your freaking furniture, and I got to keep it. Yeah, you did nice. get to. Yeah, you got to keep my furniture too. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. some of it's still in my own apartment. Yeah, <laughs> no, I remember I went over to your apartment like uh, not that recently, but like a while ago, and then I was like, wait, this is all my silverware. You still kept my silverware because yeah. I didn't bring any of that home with me. And guess yeah. what? I use your blender every Sunday for shakes. Oh no, that wasn't my blender actually. <laughs> that was my pre the the previous roommate before you. That was her blender that she just left behind, and so I no, I inherited bad. it. Whose blender? <laughs> Beth's blender. It's it's scary not knowing whose blender is my blender. <laughs> yeah, well it's yours now. That's the thing. It's been passed it's down yours. down the That's the, the lineage of roommates to you. So you're welcome. You can't have generational roommate blenders. <laughs> yeah. How long were you guys filming at a time? Uh, okay, so for the the filming for that, the post production lasted a lot longer than the filming, which is about regular. Yeah. But for the actual filming. Uh, that it was filmed over about two and a half months. So from uh, March 2021 to uh, just I think about 10 days into May was when like the principal photography was done on the mountain. And then there was an additional interview that was conducted in June of that year. And then another one that was conducted in November that year after that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so like overall, I guess it like together that would be about three months of shooting um, for that film. 
Um, yeah, and then on the post production uh, post production side of things, it was a little bit more complicated because originally the the way that we were trying to do it was like um, I had the hard drive full of footage, and we were hoping to get the film done very quickly because we wanted it in time for Banff, which is like a very big um, adventure film festival. Um, so we had about eight weeks from that to, to try and put it together. So me and my assistant basically combined forces and we were trying to write the film alone and edit it alone. And the director was off um, <clears throat> on another trip working on another project. Um, so we just, we just didn't have enough support, so it didn't work. So eventually, I think like about six weeks in, we got the call and was basically like, like yeah, we need to we need to restart and we need to rethink about how we're going to actually achieve this because this just isn't enough time and what we're submitting isn't quality, um, and so we took a break from the film until about November of that year um, after we had basically like the director hired a writer on for us to help us structure the story because that's what we were really um, struggling with. Um, and so he brought that writer on and that writer just did a very good job of structuring like where to start the story, where to end the story. Um, and he just did a good job of like giving us a very good foundation to add in the scenes that we wanted to add in. Cause his, uh, the original script for the, the film was probably about 25 minutes, like the original edit. And then uh, me and Tommy basically sat down and, and just started, uh, started adding in the scenes that we felt were right uh, in order to, to um, basically propel the film forward and, and elevate it um, beyond what that original script was. Um, and so once I restarted editing the film in November when we had like a finished script and all that, it was, I, I think about a nine week, um, thing from basically an empty timeline to the picture lock. And then it, of course it went through more iteration after that while, when we like got into the weeds of like sound design and scoring and visual effects and things like that. But like the actual editing process was basically from late November to early January. That was when the bulk of it was done. Well, I was wondering why you weren't on our Christmas party this year, and then I realized, oh, wait, you are deep, deep stuff oh, yeah. in this world. Oh, my God. And, and also, so, like, yeah, I went home for Christmas as well, and I brought a laptop with me, and so I was editing during Christmas. And then during that time, like, I don't know um, if you guys remember, but last year, like, Boulder was getting set on fire, like, every two weeks or so. Um, and so there was, like, a massive fire that just – you know, obliterated Boulder County. A lot of homes were destroyed. And I have like a specific memory where I was editing and I was checking like online to see where the evacuation zones were to make sure that my house was just, because my house was like slightly outside of the evacuation zone for that. Um, and so it was very like nerve wracking. Like it was just like, it was the worst editing. Well, I had two really terrible editing sessions over that. Cause there was another editing session I had where my dog died that day. Uh, as well, and so that was like miserable too. But I had to get the work done. You, I'm perceiving you as someone really confident, and I'm wondering um, personally, what was it that kind of brought you out of your shell? You talked a little bit about this at the beginning of the interview, but do you think it was COVID? COVID definitely helped um, in a sense of that during that time. Like I just, I didn't feel successful, um, like at all, like in, in any sort of aspect of my life, you know, it's like I went to, to film school and was like, you know, a pretty, pretty successful editor, like within those college walls. And then it's like, suddenly I come out into the real world and suddenly no one gives a shit. Right. Um, and so that was like, you know, it, it was a pill that I would, I knew I, I would have to swallow, like as I was getting to, to graduation and things like that. But I just, I didn't expect it to like hit that hard. And I think the pandemic made that worse. Cause obviously it was a lot harder to find employment than it regularly is. Um, so like that was part of it. And, and, you know, during that time, like basically the only thing I had to do was like introspect, you know, and like, and figure out where I went wrong. Like, and, and what, like, what could I blame on the pandemic and what couldn't I play, blame on the pandemic essentially. And like, and so I was living in my, with my parents in California, like couldn't go out and meet, meet people or anything like that. Cause this was pre vaccine. And like, even though if I had gotten the pan or the, um, COVID, I probably would have been fine, but like, you know, my parents are in their sixties. Like I can't, I, I would never forgive myself if I brought that in the household. So it was basically the only thing I had to do was, was think about like who I wanted to be after we were, I was through that and I had a new job. And so I eventually ended up getting a job here back out here in Colorado. Uh, and then when I came back, I just decided I didn't want to be the person that I was. You know, Michael, I think Michael 2.0, because we, the Michael, we, before we loved him. He was great. He was amazing. <laughs> Michael 2.0, he's a badass. He's a lady killer. <laughs> <laughs>
he can get the job done. Yeah. So why well, thank you, Hunter. <laughs> I'm I'm both impressed and afraid of you at the same time, which is exactly <laughs> what you want to be. <laughs> it feels good to like have the gap between who I was and who I want to be like very close now. You know that that's that to me is like my greatest achievement. Like the film basically just kind of folds into that because I don't think I would have had the confidence to try to do a project like this beforehand. Um, before that, but like. Yeah, it, that to me is like the biggest achievement over the last two years, and the film is a part of that. Just sort of feeds into that. Well, it's interesting you're saying that because you are you were the top editor at our alma mater CFS. Like you, one of them for yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, you you know, like you you there was always neck and neck, and there was always like competition of who would be the strongest editor. You're the one who won the award at the end because your movie is the strongest. You and Ben Rand, who was also a roommate at that same apartment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, <laughs> you guys made a movie together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a student film, but always the, the the amazing part of you is there. So tell us about a little bit about that movie. So that one, that was like my first foray really into like, like um, I guess real narrative um, editing. I know like some people won't consider it real because it was a student film, but like it, it was the first time I had tried my hand at like a, a big-ish project. Um, and that film was like very dramatic and required me to really empathize with, uh, with a perspective that, um, I personally have no experience with him because a lot of it is about a mother, you know, grieving over the death of her son. Like that's something that Ben and I don't really have much experience with, but we both can empathize with loss. Right. And so, um, there were a lot of, that was very much an exercise in, in trying to empathize with a different perspective. And then also just really, going in on on pacing and um and how to how do you make something feel slow paced without it dragging um you know because like the earlier cut the the final cut of that film ended up being about 14 minutes we had earlier cuts that were like 21 and things like that and yeah it was slow paced and you felt it you know and and we didn't we didn't want that so we had to do a lot of very creative things um when making that film to try and figure that out and and it was nice because Ben and I were both kind of in the camp of like we're both learning at the same time of, of how to make this good. Um, and so there was a, a very nice like equalizing factor there, which I think like really helped sort of like our creative collaboration on that. Um, and then that film ev eventually ended up getting picked up uh, for distribution by a YouTube channel called Alter. And they publish a lot of um, short like horror short films that were either produced independently or as students. And so our film kind of got like it's 15 minutes of fame on there, which is which is nice that it was it was a place for people to see because it, it very clearly is something that like if you're a certain kind of person, it will very it will it will affect you emotionally. And I think like that to me is like my greatest achievement with that film is like just, you know, going online and reading the comments of like people who have had those similar experiences and saying that, like, we got it right. Like, that's a very you know, um, a very heartwarming thing. We all know that Corey Richards uh, decided to retire in 2021 before mm -hmm. the summit of this of this uh, event, uh, Dara Gary. So tell us, what was that process like? You were there at triage when this happened. What did you guys say in the room? So I was actually working from home uh, when that happened, but like, you know, like the characters in the film said, like it basically was just, um, you know, you have to just accept it and find another plan. Like that's, that's how he felt, and and we respected that, and um, and we ended up uh, the Dalagiri project changed direction very significantly because of that, um, and you know who who knows the film it would have been um, if that hadn't happened, you know like we we just can't say, but like I think that everyone involved in the in the project is happy with with how the film turned out, um, regardless of of that change of plan, um, so there wasn't really. I mean, it really affected the people on the mountain more so than than here, back, like me here back in Colorado. I mean, I had just signed on to the project at that point, so it basically was just a matter of like basically waiting and seeing to see um, how the project would develop beyond beyond that decision. So Topo, he is a like you know he's a rising star in the in the in the climbing community. What was the pressure that was put on him that you could see, you know, maybe from the footage we didn't see in the movie? I think that from, and, and this is kind of covered in the film, but for him, like, definitely the big, the big thing was that it kind of, uh, it was the end of a, of a climbing partnership that um, had been going on for three years. And the thing about it is that when you get to that level in climbing, when you're climbing 8,000 meter peaks, like, you can't just go on Craigslist and find like a new climbing partner. Um, like that's not how it works. You know, there are 
only a finite amount of people in the world who are equipped to do that sort of thing and have interest in doing that sort of thing. Um, and so for him, I think it was just coming to terms with the fact that, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the work that he had put in, in the last three years wasn't to waste, but like, uh, uh, you know, like he couldn't, he could no longer, um, pursue, uh, the former climbing ambitions that he had. Um, and so I think like that was kind of like the big thing and, and a, a huge part of telling the story was figuring out how to present that with, um, all perspectives involved so that we can be fair to all parties because Topo obviously like he has a perspective that makes sense right like of course you would you would try to be respectful towards your friend because he's he's not he doesn't want to do this thing anymore but then at the same time you're still going to mourn the relationship that you had right um, and so in the beginning it was pretty difficult because we didn't have really a good interview that like pre presented the other side of the story which basically is like hey if you're not if you don't want to climb an 8,000 meter peak, you should not feel forced to, right? Because it's a, you could die. And, and so that's when a, a large part of why Adrian Ballinger is in the film, uh, and he's like a very big um, climbing figure in the community. The reason why we ended up interviewing him largely is because he's friends of both parties and was able to sort of give us um, both perspectives and we could incorporate that into the film and really give both parties a fair shake. Welcome to Game Time. It's Rapid Fire and it's a game called Documentary Now or Real Doc. You have to answer one thing. If a movie is an actual documentary or if it's an episode of Documentary Now. Okay. Yeah, we'll see how we'll, we'll see how this goes. Like I I honestly am not that well versed in uh in documentaries um, cuz like I said documentaries chose me. You just take, have to stab at it. Just take a stab at it and say sure. that's a documentary or that's an episode of Documentary Now. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. As much as I'll ever be. Documentary about the cousins of Eleanor Roosevelt living in squalor real real doc yes okay yeah i was like that sounds real that sounds like semi-interesting it's 1976 uh, called great gardens documentary oh, man now, yeah documentary now episode about the cousin of eleanor roosevelt living in squalor but they're murderers i mean that's a that's isn't that a documentary now episode that's a documentary now episode. yeah ding okay. ding ding yes okay, correct. Yeah, yeah. documentary following edgy yet fashionable reporters on the search for mexican drug lords isn't that just every vice documentary it's actually an episode of documentary now <laughs> okay but it's probably making fun of vice documentaries right like because yeah, that yeah. sounds exactly what vice does yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. so you're both wrong and you're right oh uh, yeah documentary about a sushi chef that's gotta be real. Yes, it's called Hero Dreams of Sushi. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I saw that on HBO. I think yeah, yeah. documentary about uh, a chef's son who's obsessed with chicken and rice. Documentary now. It's called Juan Likes Rice and Chicken. <laughs> Wait, that's a real one. It's a, it's you know it's it's a documentary now episode. But oh okay it's so okay good. okay okay. I was like I could not believe that that's real because I don't know like maybe if, if it was like a short I could see that like yeah. I don't know. I just I feel like if you're a good enough filmmaker, you can probably make any subject interesting if you try to make a documentary out of it. Oh, this one's interesting. Fred Armisen shoots a uh, piece of raw chicken out of a potato launcher. That sounds like fun. It's the best 22 minutes I've ever had in my entire life. That sounds good. Yeah. Documentary about a Serbian performance artist before her exhibit at MoMA. Real. Documentary about a Serbian performance artist before her exhibit at MoMA, but her lover, Fred Armisen, shows up to wreck things. How does he wreck things? But with his presence. That, that's it? <laughs> that's literally it? It is Fred Armisen, after all. Dude, that's like how 80% of people just feel, period. <laughs> <laughs> it's the vibes. You yeah. just ruined the vibes. Yeah. yeah. So which one is it? A real, right? No, episode documentary. Oh, now. really? Oh, okay. <laughs> they just they just did the whole thing, but th like they got the documentary right, like, toe for tea. Then mm -hmm. they just added Fred Armisen. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Documentary about Michael Jordan's last season with the Chicago Bulls. That one's real. Yeah. Yes. Documentary about three champion bowlers in the bowling league in Las Vegas. And if one of them wins, he gets to live in a retirement village for the rest of his life. That's got to be a Documentary Now episode. Absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay. I was like. Okay. Here's, here's one for all the marbles. All the marbles. Ready? This one is a documentary about Muhammad Ali in his bout against George Foreman called The Rumble in the Jungle in Zaire. Is that real? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's called When We Were Kings. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. It's it's. Like, I haven't seen. By the way, audience, I have not seen any of these. 
thus far. He I'm totally great. just guessing. Like <laughs> he did good. Yeah. Certified champion documentary man. Michael, what do you think was the best part about having me as your roommate? Um, for me it was just peace of mind with like knowing that the home was like always peaceful, pretty much. Um, because like living in that house I'd lived with some other people before that and with each one of them there was like definitely enough conflict to where like it would be a source of stress like being at home every day and so just like having a place to come home and not feel stressed about really anything um is a great thing because like mental health wise it really helps like when you can just keep your stressors like wherever they're at so it's like if it's school related stress like the fact that like i don't have to feel that when i go home or if it's work related stress the fact that i don't have to go home and then be introduced to new stress um, that was very nice. That was like very good peace of mind. You always wore pants. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean like, that's like, yeah, that's a big one. I mean like I, I, do, I had a roommate recently where he just like didn't wear a shirt, but, like not like that's a big deal or anything, but like that was just his thing, you know, <laughs> you, me. you always, always wore pants and you're always good to champ champ loved you. Oh yeah. Champ was good. Champ. <laughs> Michael, we are so excited for what triage is doing and what you are doing. Thank you so much for being my roommate. Thanks for being such a cool fucking guy. Yeah, no, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and even if you're on a big, scary old mountain that uh, no one can, no one's been able to climb certain parts of until now, or yep. if you're just hanging out in Boulder making movies, mm -hmm. you got to stop and watch some locally produced content. Yeah. What is the thing you always say? Denver, stay ten toes down. And stay creative, Colorado. Yep. <laughs>